Hello and welcome to Respiratory Pneumothorax. This is part of our Nursing Emergencies Program. A pneumothorax, or at least some ways that we can prevent it, include limiting our positive pressure ventilation. Now this is talking about mechanical ventilation and BiPAP, CPAP, etc. The more pressure we use in the thorax, the more likely it is that we're going to pop this balloon. So if you think about the lungs as being like balloons and we're inflating them, if you blow too much air into a balloon, you will cause it to pop. And the same kind of thing can happen with our lungs with positive pressure ventilation. So we want to try to avoid or limit, I should say, our positive pressure ventilation. Certainly there's situations where our patient needs positive pressure ventilation. In those situations, we'll try to use the least invasive and the least amount of therapy as possible. So rather than intubating and ventilating, we may put the patient on BiPAP instead so that we can limit our positive pressure ventilation. Using instructional techniques for central line insertions has decreased the number of pneumothoraces we see considerably. Years ago, there was very little instruction for physicians on central line insertion, and so they kind of all just did it the way that they were taught or the way that they felt like doing it, which resulted in quite a few pneumothoraces as uh, physicians who were kind of digging around in there may have nicked along and we end up with a pneumothorax. So having good instructional techniques for our central line insertions is important so that our physicians are making sure that we're not getting near the lungs and not causing an iatrogenic pneumothorax. After our central line insertions it helps to do a chest x-ray as well so we can find if there's a pneumothorax right away and also obviously check for the position of our central line. On presentation, what we expect to see is that our patient is going to have dyspnea, hypoxemia possibly, and especially as this starts to progress. A decrease in breath sounds on the affected side. Now keep in mind that part of the lung is not inflating, and oftentimes if it's a pneumothorax, the air will go to the top, so, and this is the area of the lung where we have the big airways and we hear lots of air movement. So if we're looking for decreased breath sounds, we may not hear them on that side. We may still hear breath sounds, and that's because there's only a part of the lung that is starting to collapse, not the entire thing. Another way to check to see if we're uh, the patient's developing a pneumothorax is to feel for chest excursion. Chest excursion is how much the chest expands with each breath. And we're going to see decreased excursion on that side that has the pneumothorax. X-rays, CAT scans obviously are very helpful in determining if the patient has a pneumo and how big it is. The diagram on the right is showing what happens with the pneumothorax. Normally you see the lung tissue there and we have the pleural space and then the chest wall. So normally there's a little bit of negative pressure that's in that pleural space and it's like a vacuum. It sucks the lung up against the chest wall. There's also a little bit of fluid in there too and the fluid just lubricates it so the lung doesn't rub up against the chest wall and cause the patient to have inflammation. However, if we were to get some air into that pleural space, and now the pleural space just contains a little bit of fluid and a vacuum. So if we were to put some air in there, then we lose that vacuum, the vacuum that is holding the lung open. And instead what will happen is the lung will start to collapse. Now depending upon how much air gets in there will depend upon how much of the lung collapses. So our prompt action is going to be observation. So first of all, observing the patient. Many pneumothoraces don't need to have any additional type of treatment. They may just be observed. Chest drainage. Typically, the physician is going to put in a chest tube. We hook it up to a chest drainage system. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But some other possibilities might be a thoracic catheter. These are typically used when a patient has a long-term problem. So maybe that patient has kind of a chronic leak from the lung and we have to put this in to 
kind of eliminate a chronic pneumothorax. Uh, they're also used when patients have fluid accumulation in the pleural space, and that's called a pleural effusion. So if we have a chronic pleural effusion or empyema, we'll put in a thoracic cavity catheter to drain those things. Now those are small little catheters. It's like an IV catheter except a little bit thicker and, and longer. Uh, but those are small catheters like that that are put into the pleural space and they drain out the air or the fluid over a long period. And I'm talking about like, you know, the patient goes home with these things, you know, and they have a little box that this is attached to and it continues to drain for a long period of time. Needle thoracotomy is used for our patients who develop a tension pneumothorax tension pneumothorax occurs when we not only have collapse of one lung, but we also have the collapse of the second lung from positive pressure in the chest. So when we have a pneumo, we just simply have the loss of negative pressure on the side that is affected. However, if enough air accumulates, in that pleural space, it's not only going to compress that affected lung, it will also compress the mediastinum and the non-affected lung. So what we need to do is to get rid of that positive pressure, and we do so with a needle thoracotomy. So simply take a needle, put it into the second intercostal space, midclavicular line, and we expect to hear all this air come out. That tells us that the patient had a tension pneumothorax and that we're relieving it. Now, how you would know that a patient's developing a tension pneumothorax is because they have all of these respiratory symptoms we talked about already. So they've got the chest pain, they've got the shortness of breath, etc., decreased breath sounds on that side, but then they start to develop shock. So the first thing is the respiratory piece from the lung collapsing. Second piece of that is they develop shock as a result of compressing the mediastinum. A McSwain dart is a needle thoracotomy system that is kind of has a built-in one-way valve on it so that you don't have to try to do that. Pain control is important. These tubes are painful. It's painful going in, it's painful coming out, and in many cases it's painful just to have them in. Oxygen may be necessary as well because we have part of the lung that isn't working, so we may need to give the patient some supplemental oxygen. So this is our properly functioning chest drainage system here. And what this is illustrating is your typical water-based system. We have three chambers on the left. We have our suction control. So it depends on how high you fill that water column will depend upon how much suction the patient gets. And if that water column dries out, so we turn this thing up you know, at the wall, we turn the suction at the wall up to like 200, something ridiculous. And what'll happen is it just bubbles that water away faster and it evaporates. And as it evaporates and as that water column goes down, the patient gets less and less suction. In the middle, we have a one-way valve and this is called a water seal. So what happens here as you can see is that the water seal is titling. So as you can see the water is coming up on one side and down on the other. So as the patient takes a breath in that negative pressure is being communicated back to the device and sucking the water up the right side of that column. It's taking the water, the water is, is sitting in there in kind of a bath in both columns. So when it pulls it up the right side, that means it's gonna drop the left side. When the patient exhales, then we go back to just a normal pressure situation and the water falls back down to normal. This is called titling and it's moving back and forth. And then over on the right-hand side here, we have our collection chambers and our blood in this case is collecting in that chamber. So the, pro the properly functioning chest drainage system, we first of all have gentle bubbling in the suction control. As I mentioned before, if you turn the suction up at the wall really high on this device, all that's gonna happen is we're gonna bubble away this fluid faster. Now, many devices aren't water filled. They also have a little dial on them. You dial in the amount of suction you want. So that's another possibility that there could be a dial on your device that dials in the amount of suction. In those cases, you don't have this water filled, filled column that is controlling the suction. Instead, it's that little dial. 
The second piece is we expect to see titling in the water seal itself. So we expect to see this moving back and forth in the water seal. If the water in the water seal is just sitting there still and not moving at all with the patient's breaths, then that means you have an obstruction somewhere. So somewhere in the system it's obstructed. Maybe this blood is coming down, clotted off the tubing or whatever. But somewhere along the way we have an obstruction. So we expect to see titling in our water seal if the system is patent. Some systems have a closed water seal system. So the water seal is enclosed in a little container. And what they will tell you is there's there's a little device there that or a little marker that will tell you whether or not the water seal is working correctly. And then we have consistency in our drainage. So we expect to see that the drainage is consistent and that we're not having a big change. If I'm getting 100 mLs per hour of blood out of this patient, I don't expect the next hour to be 300. Okay, that's not having consistency in drainage. If that bloody drainage turns clear or cloudy, those are things that I would want to report, and that's a good sign, but that's something I'd want to report. Same thing is true if we go from maybe clear drainage to having drainage now that contains some blood. So our takeaways here is to the pneumothorax is a result of air that's in the pleural space. So we lose the suction in the pleural space and that allows the lung to collapse. So the treatment will be then that we're going to put some suction back into that pleural space to re-expand the lung and we do that with a chest tube. A pneumothorax can cause hypoxemia and watch for a tension pneumothorax which will be evidenced by severe hypoxia and by the development of shock. Thank you for joining me for our respiratory pneumothorax, part of our nursing emergencies program. Stick with us here and keep going in the nursing emergencies program.